Welcome to Dairy Livestream. I'm your host, Corey Geiger, Managing Editor of Hordes Dairymen. We are broadcasting from the Cheese Cave, our studio in downtown Fort Atkinson, at the historic W.D. Hord & Sons Company building commissioned by Wisconsin Governor W.D. Hord. My coworker, Caitlin Allen, who is in our Cheese Cave with me, will be handling the audience questions, and our producer, Jim Baltz, with the University of Illinois, will be running the remainder of the broadcast. Our conversation today will focus on this year's corn silage may feed differently. During this episode, we'll focus on the stark differences that we're seeing in fiber and starch digestibility compared to a baseline year for corn silage. The webcast will be available on our Hordes Dairyman YouTube channel 24 hours after this live event. Dairy Livestream is also available to you anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Search for Dairy Livestream from the convenience of your smartphone to download the episode. As we get going, a reminder to our audience, as you hear from our panelists, please submit your questions into the GoToWebinar question panel. The earlier you ask a question, the more likely you'll get it answered on the air. Let's turn our attention to this year's corn silage may feed differently. And before we invite John Gazer onto the webcast, we're gonna to go to a poll question. The poll question will read like this. At what whole plant moisture level does starch availability drop quickly? 20% dry matter, which is 80% moisture. 25% dry matter, which is 75% moisture. 30% dry matter, which is 70% plant moisture. Or 35% dry matter and 65% moisture. And obviously there's a very important spot there to uh, make the best corn silage. So we're uh, rolling pretty good here. We'll wait, give people in the audience just a little bit more time to answer that whole question here. And let's go ahead and uh, cut the survey off here. And a grand majority of our audience got the answer right, John. It's 35% uh, dry matter and 65% moisture. Our first guest, John Gazer, will share more insight to this metric. John will also delve deeper into the thousands of corn silage samples that have rolled into Rock River Laboratory, where he is Director of Nutritional Research and Innovation. In his many industry roles, John is also an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he teaches a graduate ruminant nutrition course module on field-level carbohydrate nutrition. John is also a familiar face to Hordes Dairyman and the Hand Forage Gore audience as he contributes as a columnist to every print edition of the, both publications. That's 21 articles per year, plus a Hordes Dairyman Intel each month. Speaking of Hortz Dairyman Intel, Caitlin Allen and our former colleague Maggie Gillis will be highlighting key takeaways from this broadcast in Thursdays and Mondays, Hortz Dairyman Intel. If you're not already a subscriber, go to www.hortz.com to sign up for the newsletter that reaches 25,000 readers. John, I've been hearing this year's corn silage may not release all its starch to the cow. Is that really true? That's what it's looking like as, as we are delving into this year's crop and there are probably quite a few silos yet to be opened, but this year's feed has presented us a pretty unique set of characteristics. Uh, what, what a fantastic opportunity to be teamed up with you, Corey, uh, Dr. Hutchins, Dr. Wolf. Uh, great opportunity to get into <clears throat> this topic, this discussion today, because in my nearly 10 years now with Rock River Laboratory, I, I can't recall uh, a crop shaping out like the one that we are, are likely going to be seeing, uh, if not already feeding, and uh, the, the characteristics are, are quite unique. I get often asked, how do we evaluate corn silage quality, uh, maybe much to the chagrin of, of some of our, our seed industry colleagues and agronomists, Milk 2006 is, is dead from a practical nutrition standpoint. Milk 2006, developed by my uh, former advisor and friend and colleague, Dr. Andy Shaver, it gave us a single number of the milk potential per ton and per acre of feed. However, uh, ruminant nutrition, dairy nutritionists have, are, are, and today are utilizing much more advanced ruminant nutrition measurements on feedstuffs to predict animal responses. In the case of corn silage, 
roughly 85% of the energetic value can be dialed down, not into one single number uh, anymore, unfortunately for simplicity, but uh, we can still look at four different numbers on our feed analyses or in review and get an idea of what the energetic value of that feed will be and what, what the responses may be in intakes and performance. So I, I drill down and look at total fiber content, starch content, which give us some idea of the grain to stover ratios, but it's also important to account then for fiber digestibility and then rumen starch digestibility. So the, the latter, this last one, rumen starch digestibility, th this is really the unique characteristic of this year's crop uh, that, that may give us some fits uh, early on in, in the ensiling, early on in the fermentation. It, it may take this year's crop a couple, maybe three, four months longer to feed to its full potential. Why we're seeing that, we, we, uh, we, we make continued strides each year in seed genetics and management, but Mother Nature threw us uh, for a loop a bit this year. We had fairly dry growing conditions throughout much of the U.S., coupled with uh, adequate to more than adequate heat units. We had plenty of heat this year, but for those of us farming from the Dakotas through into Michigan, uh, in the Northeast, uh, Chris's way, we, we had a bit more moisture, but we had pretty droughty conditions. When, when we look at the environmental impact upon uh, corn yield and then quality for forage, we know that heat units and moisture are influential factors uh, relative to the outcome in, in feed quality and yield. Drought tends to improve fiber quality, fiber digestibility, but it's detrimental to yield and, and uh, grain yield. Uh, whereas moisture, or excuse me, heat units uh, can be a good thing if we have moisture, uh, but it can be a bad thing excuse me, it can be a good thing if we do not have moisture relative to forage quality, but it can be a bad thing. So we really need to, to look at both moisture and uh, heat units throughout the year. So we had plenty of heat units throughout the year, throughout the US, the moisture was lacking early, and then the moisture came on late. So what did that mean in terms of our quality? What we're starting to see, we had drought stress earlier in the year, and the plant is imprinted probably around V5 to V7. We've got some research yet to do here to, to really sort this out. But we've got pretty good fiber quality is what we're seeing for, for many growers in, in the upper Midwest toward the, the east, Chris's direction, where we had a bit more moisture, those uh, excessive or, or more than adequate heat units coupled with moisture. Our fiber quality dropped off just a little bit. But the focal point today is, is looking at the grain component. So uh, we were getting quite worried as we were getting into tasseling. And uh, fortunately, the water turned on and we, we got uh, adequate moisture for most growers out there, with the exception of some in Minnesota and the Dakotas, uh, but moisture came on through through tasseling and pollination and grain filling. We ended up with pretty strong grain yields. Yesterday, talking to some growers in eastern Wisconsin, hearing 185 to 200 bushel, which is really, really strong for that region. So we had pretty good grain yields. And uh, what I'm hearing from some uh, grain farmers and, and uh, feed mills is, is bushel weight, test weights are up. So we had a, a pretty strong kernel, pretty strong grain as well. Uh, which is great from a handling standpoint. I've analogized to being able to load some of this grain into a muzzle loader. It's muzzle loading season in Wisconsin right now. We could probably shoot some of that corn through a quarter inch plate of steel. So that's great if we're uh, out shooting steel or grain farming. It's not so great for feeding dairy cows, for feeding beef cattle. Focus today is, is dairy cattle, despite what you might see up behind me. And uh, it, it, we're seeing a little bit less in rumen starch digestibility, actually quite a bit less in rumen starch digestibility. So we've got an average to above average uh, fiber quality. We've got decent yields, but our grain component, despite decent starch levels in this year's silage, it really doesn't look like we're gonna be capturing full potential uh, here, here as soon as we might in, in prior years. Well, thank you, John. I mean, that picture behind you there, you know, if you went to some of the Western rodeos I've been there, well, at the midpoint of those rodeos, there's a milk comping, milking competition for the uh, cowboy hands there. So maybe you could uh, join that, but uh, definitely appreciate the analogy on the steel shot with the muzzle loading season upon us here as an avid deer hunter. A reminder to our audience here, as you hear questions from our panelists, submit your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll get those answered by Mike and John and Chris during the second half of the webcast. So we're going to go to another poll question here. What percent of corn silage growers experienced some drought stress? And when that question gets up on the screen, your options are going to be none, one-third, two-thirds, and everyone. 
So go ahead and answer that poll question. In these conditions, that this is not a, a scientific survey by any measure, but it's just really based on skillful observation here and talking to a lot of folks. So uh, we, we're well over the two thirds mark on getting that poll answered. So let's go ahead and see the results of that. And the correct answer is two thirds and 44% of you got that answer right. And again, that's really based on observation. It's now my pleasure to invite the legendary Michael Hutchins to Dairy Livestream. Mike is a professor emeritus at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, and has been a regular contributor to the pages of Ford's Dairyman for over four decades. And ironically, Mike's wedding reception was in my little hometown of Reedsville back when it had a pretty good uh, dining hall, but that's since, uh, quite frankly, it burnt down and didn't get rebuilt. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, I had a few weddings after years, Mike, so uh, good. <laughs> good news for you. Uh, Mike, feeding this year's corn silage will present some challenges, as John outlined. What have you been learning, and what advice might you have for others? Well, very good, uh, Corey, and, and great to be on the team uh, for today's presentation. I'm going to build on John's uh, discussion a bit and, and, and the polling question. And, and, and we're, one thing comes up is inventory. What, what's our inventory? So if you're one of those two-thirds that has less corn silage, what are you going to do? So obviously, we must know exactly what kind of supply you have on the farm and what kind of adjustment you need to make. Uh, number two, another factor comes into play, and that is what we call Christmas corn silage. And of course, that simply means I hopefully you have enough inventory to get us to Christmas, which is coming very quickly, to allow this year's crop to ferment and to become more available, as John alluded to as well. And then the third one is we, there's been a big question of how much inventory should you carry over? Because obviously that corn silage, if it's worth $45, $50 a ton, and you have a, a several bunkers or silos of it out there, obviously there is a cost associated with that. The last thing I would look at, and that is if you are going to be tight on corn silage, then you have to start making some adjustments. And the new NRC came out with a pretty neat table, which simply says if you're going to decrease the amount of forage NDF, then you're going to make other changes. For example, uh, normally we're taking around 20, 21% forage NDF. Well, if you get down to say 15% uh, uh, forage NDF, which is a low number, then that table would say you have to increase the NDF in the ration. And you say, well, how do you do that? Well, you may use another forage resource on the farm or look at byproduct feeds to get that job done. Or, and then also it says you should raise, drop the starch content down to 22% because obviously you're putting a lot more pressure on the rumen fermentation program and rumen pH and VFA patterns as well. So certainly that's gonna be all wrapped into this inventory, what, what, you're, what you're facing with. Another factor is microtoxins. And John, why don't you warm up a bit? We're hearing some reports on microtoxin and uh, that could be due to the dryness or to the wetness that came up you know, later in the season. John, what's the lab seeing? Great, great question, Mike. It, in the Midwest, it looks like our levels to moderate, our moderates maybe even down a little bit. So relatively clean crop. Hearing from Damon Smith and some other plant pathologists, we didn't see much uh, until the tar spots came in and started to move into some areas. But as we move east to the northeast, there we, we saw a little bit more in Era and Sockrot, I think, in, in talking with Marty Chilvers in Michigan State and some others. So I, we are seeing vomitoxin and some mycotoxin levels creep up a little bit toward the eastern side of the U.S. Well, that's a good answer. Be well aware if you are buying your distiller's grains, which is a corn byproduct, obviously, uh, that uh, that microtoxin concentrates in the distiller's grain. So eyes wide open on that one. If you're buying your distillers coming, say, from the Dakotas or if you're or, for, or wherever you're you're buying that that from. Another factor would be the, the fecal starch. Certainly, uh, John, your lab will provide that service there. And uh, obviously, uh, with uh, $5.84 a bushel, that's what was on the, on the screen yesterday here in Illinois, uh, you don't want to be buying too much of that. Uh, you, uh, we in Illinois like to sell it for that price, but you probably don't want to buy a lot of that right now. And so if your fecal starches get over, say, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, under 3%, and John, I think yesterday you said even down to 1%, you, it would be ideal. But if, if you're up at 5 6 7%, you're going to lose milk or you're going to buy $6 a bushel corn to build it up. Uh, another factor will become the kernel processing score. And hopefully all of you have been processing your corn harder. Now, if John says those kernels are harder, then we should have been really cranking those rollers down to one millimeter. And hopefully your scores will be well in the excess of 70s. John, the highest number I've ever seen has been about 82. Do they get higher than that? We, we've seen up to 85, but yeah, that's, that's, 
cranking pretty hard. Yep. So certainly that's another. Now, what do you do about that? Not nothing. You can't do much about that. But if that starch is coming from the grain, then obviously you can look at grinding part that particle uh, uh, finer, and, and you might be down to three, four hundred micron to get that job done. And and so certainly that becomes another factor as well. So I think my time is pretty well gone here. Uh, uh, we looked at some BMR stuff, and it looks like that one's testing good, John. Uh, uh, pretty typical. In other words, we were seeing uh, very high, uh, six, seven, eight units higher NDF digestibilities with the BMR. Not a big surprise and a little bit less starch, but it is what it is. So with that, we'll stop and see if there's some questions later on. Thanks, Corey. Excellent, Mike. And uh, we're going to go right to another poll question here shortly, but there's a reminder to our audience, as Mike alluded to here, uh, go ahead and type your questions into the GoToWebinar control panel here as we uh, hear from our panelists uh, about this year's corn silage may feed differently. So the next poll question here, and as people have watched dairy live stream, we know we have an economic twist and centric fo focus here. And uh, the next question is based on an average diet, how much does a 500 cow dairy have invested in corn silage? Now we're talking from planting to harvest and getting it in a bunker silo or bag. 50,000, 150,000, 250,000, or 350,000. Now, we had to make some assumptions on this, and uh, Mike used the word yesterday. Our audience may know we do do a dress rehearsal here the day, day before just to know what each other are talking about, but we're unscripted here in Dairy Livestream, and I think that's important to have some candid responses. So uh, the poll questions, people are giving it some thought. We're almost approaching the 50% uh, mark. You got to think about this, but corn silage just may be the biggest feed expense, definitely on the forage side. So, fifty-one percent said two hundred and fifty thousand, and thirty-eight percent of you said three hundred and fifty thousand. Our math says about two hundred and fifty thousand, and that math was completed by John Gazer and with the help of some colleagues and a spreadsheet that they developed over the years, and we verified that math yesterday during our dress rehearsal. Chris. Feed is the largest expense category on a dairy, and corn silage is the anchor forage. Let's weave this corn silage discussion into a greater issue, milk checks, margins, and cash flow. Chris? Thanks, Corey. It's good to be here again talking to you guys on a dairy live stream. Yeah, so let's, uh, you know, let me put this a little bit in an economic context. Uh, uh, milk prices uh, are looking bullish at the current time for 2022. Uh, U.S. milk production is down this last month, year over year. New Zealand and the European Union uh, milk production is down a little bit too uh, for a, a couple different reasons over there, some related to weather, some related to some new environmental rules that have gone into place. Um, but the point is that milk supplies have been tightening and butter fat in particular has been tight. So with feed being the largest expense of milk production, milk prices tend to follow feed prices but with a little bit of a lag. Um, uh, I think Mike said 584. When I looked at the board this morning, the nearby was $5.88 a bushel for corn. So it's not a great time to be in the cash market. I mean, you know, US dairy is a major user of corn, but the global corn market is massive. It's much bigger than that. So that milk prices end up reacting to feed prices rather than the other way around. The correlation coefficient between milk and feed ends up being 0.3 to 0.4 like I said, uh, reacts with a bit of a lag. At the end of the day though, what matters to dairy farm is the margin. At the current time, class three contracts for 2022, so looking out for the next year, are generally trading between 19 and $20 a hundred weight. Meanwhile, class four contracts are in that really the same neighborhood. And that's kind of the first time we've had that in a while. It re reflects the tighter butter fat supplies. Um, so, and in fact, class four is even a little bit higher than class three for a, a few months there. So depending on kind of the farm's basis situation, at the current time, we would forecast that 2022 should be a pretty decent farm milk price year. Dairy margin coverage program, which uses a national income over feed cost margin to determine whether there's going to be indemnity payments. Um, and again, just as a reminder, uses the US all milk price, uses a national uh, corn price, uses the central Illinois soybean meal price and the Supreme now, and it changed Supreme alfalfa hay price, whereas previously, at one point it was just alfalfa and then it was a mixture. So now it's supreme. So that's getting that more expensive hay in there, which is good as far as reflecting a real margin. But anyway, 
it's nobody's margin in particular, but it's probably correlated with your farm margin. At the current time, the forecast is for the, the income over feed cost national in margin in 2022 to range between 950 and 1050. Um, and you'll notice if you've participated in the program that 950 is the highest margin you can protect. So at the current time, given what we know, we would kind of not be projecting payments from the dairy margin coverage program. So, but that also means to the extent that it's correlated with your farm margin, that that's a pretty healthy margin. Um, and then kind of to finish up here, feed issues from my perspective, when I'm looking at it, tend to show up in milk per cow kind of first is where it shows up. Nationally, milk production per cow was actually down year over year in October. It was only down six pounds for the month per cow, which is not much, but still the trend is for kind of an upward uh, growth. And in many states that have been suffering from drought, milk per cow was actually down 25 to 45 pounds a cow uh, in October uh, over the, the previous year. So um, we are seeing some feed issues show up there and it's definitely having an effect. And, you know, just speaking for where I'm located here in the Northeast, it seems like it was wet, wet, wet all the time. So I, I wouldn't be surprised that uh, there were certainly um, forage issues here and, and then West for, for a completely different reason. Thanks, Chris. And actually, uh, right before we got on to uh, this webcast today, I was we're getting ready to close our December issue and mail it to our readers. And I just did the math at the close of the CME yesterday, the bundle of class three contracts for January through November of next year averages 1945 per hundredweight. And since November one to yesterday, that is up 95 cents. Hmm. And you're absolutely right. Class four has moved a much higher and obviously early in the pandemic, that was a drag on the whole milk check and really sent class one upside down, or not as not upside down, but it wasn't as good as it could have been. But that bundle, again, January through November, is two pennies short of $20. Hmm. That one moved up $1.25 here from November 1 to yesterday's trading, the anniversary of Pearl Harbor being bombed. So uh, the milk check side looks good, but there's a lot of costs that are entering the equation that we need to be cognizant of. So corn silage is an interesting crop, especially when you plant it. You can get it off a little earlier, obviously, than corn grain, but it opens the door to cover crops. And when it comes to forage inventory management, let's talk through a little bit this cover crop and bundling it with corn silage and how how uh, we can look approach that not only from ration inventory, but ration building. Mike, do you want to grab that one first? Yes, I, uh, thanks, Corey. Uh, I think it's an exciting time. Uh, the good news in Illinois, you get a small cash payment for actually putting cover crops in. That's another incentive, but it can be an extremely good crop that really fits nicely. In fact, if you look at some of the data that uh, quality issues that John talks about, the only thing you're missing is starch. A tremendous, if you catch it right, now that's always a fact, can you catch it right? But, uh, you know, we could, that's an early crop. So for some of us who have cover crops in now, uh, that'll be your first crop off next next spring, and that will allow you to stretch those corn slide inventories on the farm. John, your comments? With cover crops, uh, many of them being, being grasses, uh, they're responsive to maturity in terms of quality. So if, if we're aggressive next year, provided we have, have good field conditions and we can get out and harvest these cover crops before they put a flag leaf, before they head out just a touch, we can have some exceptional dairy quality feed to come in and both stretch inventories and, and hopefully uh, maybe boost our margins just a touch. John, another question for you on cover crops. Uh, a, a lot of the, the articles look at re, re, plowing it under. Uh, if I take that off as forage, do I have to really add some extra nitrogen so my corn crop, my, 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 my corn, uh, corn silage crop doesn't suffer? Uh, any different strategies if I take the crop or don't take the crop? Yeah, great question. Uh, and, and so we can look at it going a couple different ways with it. I'm uh, maybe stretching uh, what I'm, I'm capable of talking about with my uh, feeble agronomy and, and plant breeding background. But uh, if we plot it down, we've, we've got some nitrogen credits, we've got some organic matter credits. So uh, it, it's there in the field. If we take it off, yes, we, we will need to be mindful of the nitrogen and, and the nutrients we're harvesting from that field. And uh, as I, I think I can tee up for Chris perhaps to talk about 
what inputs are looking like from an agronomic standpoint next year, it, it's not all that pretty. Uh, so if we need the forage inventory, Mike, that you alluded to before, we, we can go get it out. But if we opt to, to till it down and seed our corn in after it, perhaps we could capture some uh, in economic returns through cutting back on our fertility. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, no, that's a good point um, from both you guys. I mean, really, so supply chain issues and some kind of geopolitical issues have, have caused uh, the, the fertilizer prices, as anybody that has known that's been looking at it, to, to go through the roof for this next year, right? So uh, Mike's uh, colleagues over there in Ag Econ at Illinois, Gary Schnitke and uh, Nick Paulson, I think, were recently put out their budgets for, the, for corn for this next year. And, it, um, you know, those fertilizer um, and energy prices really hit home. Um, and so that's going to be a big deal. Uh, the good news for dairy farmers is that they've got a very valuable commodity right now sitting in their manure pit. And, you know, uh, you know, taking advantage of that, getting it out there in the right time and getting it in the root zone and so on and so forth, I think uh, it's, you know, better to be having that manure this next year. So, Chris, let me ask you, should I, should I buy fertilizer? Should I go now or should I wait till next spring? Maybe the price is lower. You're the economist. You should be able to answer that question. What, <laughs> what should I do? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question, Mike. Um, I have not looked at forecasting fertilizer prices. I think given where they are his, compared to where they have been historically, there's more likelihood of the things getting disentangled and them coming down. But there are people out there studying the fertilizer markets that you probably should ask. But to me, if we're sitting at historic highs, there's more potential for downside than there is for upside. Yeah, you know, as someone, I, I crop some acres here too. And as you walk through that, I, I did already pre-buy my fertilizer for next year, but it, it's a very volatile market. Obviously, uh, China's basically not exporting much fertilizer. Uh, natural gas is a big component of creating fertilizer. And that price peaked here about a month ago. And it's been coming down some, but all of a sudden we get a cold winter and high demand in the Northeast part of the United States, and that can all change real quickly. I mean, it's been rather mild here. I, uh, you know, it comes down to the cold cost of production too. You gotta look at what risk you're willing to take and where it fits in. Now, late October, the agronomy group that I work with, uh, he, he said it was his final week of the year. I mean, he was working till two in the morning. I got my, four, my uh, fertilizer, uh, recommendations at 2 a.m. and he said he'd honor them for 24 hours and that's the, uh, the kind of turnaround that they were having uh, didn't want to touch anything else at that point and which should include you know uh, spraying and herbicides and those and seed purchases he said we'll deal with that later um, but a, lo a lot of a lot of different issues moving around right now and you know not easy not easy to forecast you know, one other question here that we should talk about here, inventory. How much is too much inventory? And I remember, uh, I was pretty young yet, but when we went through the drought of 1988, my dad always, from that point forward, as he kept seeing semis of a Colorado Supreme Quality Alfalfa hay roll in his yard to feed the dairy herd, you know, he, he was always cognizant of inventory, but there's a point that you can have too much inventory as well, because that's, uh, that's an asset just sitting there until it goes through the cow. Chris, what's the right balance on inventory management? You work with a lot of New York dairies and Michigan. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, having more inventory is in some sense is a risk management type of issue as long as we're not worrying about the quality going down if it's getting too old or not stored right. Probably depends on storage conditions. I'm sure Mike and John will talk about that. Um, you know, there's an opportunity cost to having all of that sitting there, right? Um, it's just same thing with having too much working capital, too much liquidity. Um, you know, all, on the other hand, so it really depends on what else you could be doing with the, with the, you know the time to put it up and the, with the storage space and the other uh, management aspects that go with it. So it kind of, it's a trade off there between kind of your risk management and your opportunity cost. Anything Mike, there, John or Mike? I, I'll jump in on, on Chris's comment that the, the reason we, we add and have added inventory and made recommendations of three, six months, uh, some dairies out there have 12 months or even more of inventory on farm. It, it's for that grain. It's for that starch and starch digestibility to improve. When, when we've experienced the new crop slump in the past with getting into new or fresher corn silage, it's, it's attributable to that, that grain not being as soft as it will be after three or six months of, of fermentation. 
And so we, we build up these inventories, uh, yes, for risk management in the event that we have a catastrophic drought, but really also to, at the same time, optimize the energy value per pound to capture that starch and grain digestibility. Coming back to what, what I spoke about before, what we're recognizing, thanks to Mother Nature coming out of this year, we've got a harder grain. So dairies that perhaps have a bit more inventory may be in a better position letting that silage cook out longer. I look forward to Mike's comments. Yeah, I don't have much to add to it at this point. All I know is uh, one of our very large herds in the state was down to literally days of forage inventory. Uh, and, and trust me, when you've got thousands of cows, uh, that's a scary place to be. So he's running a year ahead. He's running a year ahead on, on, on his inventory and uh, says, I'm not going to take that chance again. Can, wait, I have a question. Uh, this, this is The Economist, so I don't know this stuff. Can it get too old? Can the silage, is there, a, is, there a, is there a curve? We want to be old enough for the corner to be digestible, but can it be, can we get too old? Can we get out there or not? I, I can jump in and speak to this. So in my experience at Rockover Laboratories, I work with locations from uh, New York to California. I've gotten to see a lot of different silages. Uh, there was one that came in the lab and then I talked to the nutritionist and the farmer. Uh, at that point, it, it was, let's, let's call it, uh, I don't know, 2015, 2018, something like that. And uh, it, was, it was coming out of a little bit drier conditions where inventories weren't as great, like Mike spoke about perhaps for, for some out there. But uh, he, he was adamant that that corn silage he submitted to the laboratory was from 1988, 1988. You remember the door, something along those lines. But speaking to your point, can it get too old? If, if we do a good job sealing our silage, keeping the air out, keeping the, the, it under plastic, the, 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 the silo sealed, it, it can be stored indefinitely. So in, in my opinion, no. My only added comment would be we had a farmer who had a silo and after about four years, it started to run again. And then I'd be a little nervous that they were starting to see some degradation occurring there. I think that risk could be more in a tower silo that's maybe 80 feet tall, where you got tremendous pressure on that, that bottom third of the structure. And so we'd encourage our guys who got silos is uh, we're not making cheese out there. So it doesn't get better with age. So uh, if at all possible, get down to the bottom. Don't leave that bottom uh, 10 feet there year after year after year. Well, let's go to an audience question here. Uh, this question comes in, what is the best lab measure or assay to evaluate starch divest digestibility in corn silage? What, uh, and how accurate is that measure, whatever your recommendation is, given uh, the sample is ground? So I think we really should turn to John first on that one. Yeah, and I might take it two directions. So uh, the, our commercial laboratories, Cumberland Valley, Rockover Laboratory, Darling Laboratory, we, we've, we've developed lab bench or uh, rumen incubation protocol so we can get an idea of rumen starch digestibility with our corn silages. Uh, there are a little bit different protocols depending upon the laboratory, but we're, we're giving out numbers that will index starch digestibility. And what we've recognized with corn silages, we will range anywhere from, uh, in my experience, through Rock River, 60 to upwards of 95% in rumen starch digestibility. So the, those, those values, those results back uh, for, from the, the labs, they, they can help us benchmark and, and figure out where we are at. In terms of accuracy, predicting, uh, I might define accuracy as predicting animal response. They, we, we do a pretty good job. Uh, but the ultimate definition of accuracy is, is what the cow says. And there's another really good tool, one that I'll come back to that Mike alluded to before, and I've learned a great deal uh, from Dr. Hutchins, some of his work, uh, Randy Shaver, Jimmy Ferguson, coming back and looking at what cows aren't digesting. Chris made mention of value in the manure pit before in terms of fertility, nitrogen credits, uh, and, and other. Well, there is some perhaps unfortunate value in a lot of manure out there and just grain passing through and looking at in manure. So. Uh, looking at fecal starch, uh, I actually would start by looking at fecal starch on farm and uh, really look forward to, to Mike's thoughts on if we have a little bit elevated fecal starch, what do we do with that? Well, that's a tough one. Uh, I, first of all, the question is if you can diagnose it. If, if it's in, coming from the corn silage, then you're, you're in trouble. Um, what are you going to do? I, I can't process it again at that is stage. Now, if it's coming from the grain side, being from uh, corn or sorghum, whatever the case is, then I would uh, suggest we look at maybe really a, a hammering it, for lack of a better word, and really bring the particle size down to see if I can get better fermentation in the rumen and availability. And again, John, I think my cows will answer that question for you. 
Uh, question for you though, John, and that is, it's seven hours. Is that the magic time or how, the one I see is seven hour in vitro. Is, is that the magic measure? Yeah, it, this comes from some of Mike Allen's research at, at Michigan State and, and seven hours would correspond to uh, a certain rumen retention time. So Mike used that as a proxy for rumen digestion. I, I think we've maybe gone a bit further than, than uh, Dr. Allen intended it at that point, but we're at a point where we're better understanding grain and starch digestibility within the rumen. It is a nonlinear process, not to get too deeply into the weeds, but seven hours, uh, it, it will give us a good benchmark value out to consider. And Corey, just for our listeners, if it's valuable, if every one one point, uh, Dr. Ferguson said that's about uh, two thirds of a pound of milk. So you can uh, see that if you know if, if your fecal starch is up at six percent, which is a pretty high number actually for for dairy beef cattle, those guys are nuts. But anyway, we'll we'll leave that for another day. Uh, you can back that out, and so uh, you can figure out well if I'm missing a four four points, and it looks like I'm be two or three pounds of milk, which is going to be equal to probably a pound pound and a half of corn. So uh, pick, pick pick your poison. I, I'd buy the damn corn. I would put the corn in because if I'm going to get twenty dollar milk, uh, I'll 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 ride that dry matter cost. It's pure economics, isn't it, Chris? So the next question here, um, and we're going to, this audience member really frames this nicely, but uh, we've been talking about here on Dairy Livestream and a number of other media outlets, the how uh, butter fat component levels have gone up sharply here over the past decade. So with that in mind, uh, the question from the audience member reads, especially in the Midwest, corn silage seemed to raise comp uh, percent components when those bunkers were open. Should we expect a fallback to yeah, excuse me more historical fat percent and protein percent based on tests coming in on 2021 corn silage? So we're going to talk about how the corn silage is impacting uh, feeding rates right now, and then we're going to come back and talk about national component levels and how that's changed, and we'll follow that up with Chris. So we'll start out with Mike and John on that. And we yesterday we uh, there was a gentleman on Facebook that posted his shipped milk uh, weights for November, a Holstein herd had averaged four, six, and three, five. I mean, numbers that if you didn't know the person, you'd almost say that's unbelievable. But the, the, the world and component levels are changing because fat is in demand. But let's talk how it relates to corn silage, Mike and John. John, why don't you go ahead and start and I'll finish up. All right. Well, I, I, I let in with uh, some description of this year's crop being unique. And, and, and we've been talking about and uh, hammering, no pun intended, hammer mill, but on, on the grain uh, and, and starch digestibility. But I also want to comment to fiber, the fiber quality. Uh, as we talk about production and components, that's going to represent the uh, gross income. But uh, I appreciate Chris's discussion from a margin standpoint uh, earlier. I, I also want to consider this year's crop and what impact it might have on dry matter intake in addition to performance. Uh, one thing that I've speculated and as I brought up with nutritionists that uh, I think the question uh, was geared toward what should we be expecting in performance and, and components with this year's uh, th this new crop, we're certainly uh, hearing accounts of exceptionally high component levels. So that, that 4, 4.5 butterfat with Holstein herds, 3.1, 3.3 .3, uh, protein values with Holstein herds. I mean, we, we've got really high levels. I'd, I'd love to tell you all that uh, ruminant nutrition, our nutritionists out there are just that good. Uh, but I think a lot of this has to do uh, with the, the crop quality this year. We just have a little bit more moderate starch digestion coupled with that uh, average to above average fiber digestion, unless you're in New York, fiber digestibility is a, a little bit less out there. So we've got this unique crop that, that's giving us this unique outcome in, in performance, but pay attention to your intakes as well. Uh, I've had some suspicion, if our fiber digestibility is up and we think back to BMR versus conventional research, if we have higher fiber digestibility, we know that cows can eat more, which then ties into the greater milk production. So make sure we're paying attention to dry matter intakes in addition to our components and our, our milk responses, because we need to look at production relative to our intakes and, and really uh, make sure that we're, we're not giving up some in terms of feed efficiency with this year's crop. I, I think that may be the case in some cases, especially with that uh, hampered starch digestibility. Yeah, John, I think you're spot on. I think uh, what does the animal's rumen do to those fr fractions that John just walked you through? And and then the, the other side could be, I'm not sure it's true on this farm, and that sometimes when milk volume goes down, components sometimes can go up. 
So to me, uh, I would I would ask that farmer to see how many pounds of protein and fat is he marketing. You know, and our best herd, our very best herd, in Illinois, is at 8.4 pounds per cow per day. So he's he's running with 104 pounds of milk on 400 cows with a four butter fat and a three two according to DHI. So. Uh, that's another factor to take a look at. Are you are you trading a little bit of milk volume, which with today's market is not bad. I mean, uh, components really build the milk tech. And that component story has really evolved quite a bit here. We could have a year here when the numbers are tallied by April that the national bulk tanks at over 4% butter fat, which we haven't seen since pre-World War One. I. I mean, that's really changing what's happening on the processing end, isn't it, Chris? Yeah, no, they, uh, you know, the long-term trend has been increasing components, um, and it, but really, this, I mean, so October, they just put out the numbers for all federal milk marketing orders, and across all orders, it was 4% uh, butterfat for the month of October, 3.26% protein, um, and, you know, 4.2% butterfat in the Pacific Northwest, and 4.19 in the Southwest, so just really impressive, and, and as these guys are saying, like, that's where the incentives are, too, right, because not only does that increase, but by the way, as a side note, higher components means a lower PPD because we set those class prices at, uh, you know, three, five uh, butter fat. But that's beside the point. You're going to get paid on all your components first at that class three price. Right. So um, not only that, but a lot of the farm's expenses are based on hundred weight and not components. So you're going to pay hauling based on hundred weight that they haul away. You're going to pay promotion based on hundred weight that you market and uh, if you have a if you're in a place that has a base excess program that's not going to be based on components it's going to be based on hundred weight so all of this not only from a revenue side but a cost side is lining up with uh, encouraging more components and you know nutrition genetics and whatever else farmers are doing a great job responding well, let me throw one more thing in, Corey, if I can, before you move on to the next question. And that is, we always track the hordes, dairymen, DHIR averages you report in your August issue. And it's surprising to me, the, the breed that really improved the last three years is Holstein. They went from like a 3.7 to almost a 3.93 three or something like that. The other breeds didn't move very much. And I, John, I can't explain that, but uh, the, the Holstein one uh, re really moved. And so that becomes a common question at some of our meetings, you know, and I, I think this year's uh, uh, side, corn silage crop can answer part of it. But then, of course, the interest of adding fat to the diet, that continues to be another factor as well. And, and then the other part is uh, genetics in the animals. And boy, in the last four or five years, you'd be hard pressed to find a bull in the top uh, ranking of any list uh, that's not positive for components. And that you wouldn't have seen 25 years ago. And it all bundles together to everything that Chris has been saying as well. The uh, reminder to the audience, you can go ahead and ask a question in our GoToWebinar control panel here, and uh, we'll get those asked on the air. And so the next audience question here, and we'll probably send this to Mike maybe first, and if he wants to deflect it to John, I'll give him that privilege. <laughs> In a perfect world, on average, how long should non-BMR corn silage ferment before feeding it to maximize available nutrients? And that comes into your Christmas corn silage, but is there a different fermentation profile for BMR versus non-BMR as a follow-up? Well, I'm going to deflect that latter part to John. Um, my 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 Hutchins guess is there's probably not a big difference in fermentation, as long as the starch content stays somewhat comparable and the and the dry matters are there as well because the pHs are are very very typical. So I would my guess is we don't we don't see a big change there. Uh, again, I've I've seen people say a minimum of three to four months as far as that goes, and uh, I'm not sure. John, do we gain much after six or eight months? based on your lab results on the uh, uh, the, the starch digestibility? It'll tie into to the year, I think, and where, where we started out. Uh, so the I've seen some years where it, it's been by November, December, this this point in the year, where, where we've been feeding to about the uh, level that, that corn silage will, and then we just roll from there forth. However, prior years, uh, I think back probably two, three years where we were a little bit late getting in the fields just due to monsoons of rains, that crop continued to mature, that grain continued to mature. We ended up with a little bit more mature crop in a lot of silos. That didn't feed to its full potential until probably March, April the following year, if you can believe it. So that would be a six to even eight months out. Uh, so that, that, that 
difference between those two. I mean, the, the crop fermented, but it really was just how hard was that grain going in? So as I think about what we're seeing this year with harder grain in the silage, I, I'm I'm thinking it, it might be a good six months before this silage really hits its stride and we're feeding it to its full potential. Then, go ahead. No, I was going to stop and just ask you, so if I'm the nutritionist, should I add some more corn now for the next two to three months? And what should I be watching for to uh, when I can pull that $6 corn out of the, out of the ration? Yeah, I, you know, th this question came up yesterday with some, some producers uh, in, in a talk I gave on kind of a similar concept. What do we do? I, I think it starts with figuring out where are we at, how, how much corn is passing through cows, uh, because there are some good silages out there. Maybe it's seed genetics, maybe it's how we managed, uh, managed them. So on average, we're seeing starch digestibility down a little bit. And guess what? It's not just silage. It's also shelled corn. So there's a there's maybe a little bit of uh, an added value for you all today. Maybe pay attention to your shelled corn in addition to silage. But the focus here today is silage. And uh, so there is some some good stuff out there. But um, if, if, if we're pushed down a little bit in starch digestibility, we, we're, we're going to need to let it ferment out longer and, and then probably consider uh, bumping up starch in the diet or maybe looking at some other uh, nutrition strategies such as bringing in maybe raw corn starch, pea starch, or there are some research backed uh, enzymes out there, amylase, for example, that, that might might come in and, and bring, bring some benefit to help break down starch. Uh, there may be some research backed probiotics as well that could help improve starch digestibility, uh, particularly in the, the lower GI tract. So I, I think uh, especially with the five to six dollar corn and, and what Chris talked about for uh, milk price or at least uh, for futures or what they're looking like we have added incentive to do everything we can uh, to optimize what we're getting out of, of every bushel of corn in the diet speaking of added incentive here so we're talking about this year's diet but there's another incentive here and it's it's shrink and reducing shrink and not only for corn silage but some farms have gone from you know commodity based to storing some of their most precious commodities and bins and those things Chris, you may encounter these kind of questions uh, through your work in economics. What what kind of thoughts should a, a farmer be looking at here versus in upgrading maybe a, a feed storage for commodity or making that improvement to storage for corn silage? Yeah, well, I, I think that's going to take, uh, you know, pushing the pencil about uh, getting some idea about what kind of waste or, and shrink that they're having versus looking at opportunities. Um, th those kind of investments tend to be driven by uh, better years, right? When you're looking for where you've got a little bit of uh, capital to put into something like that. Right now, we still have, uh, hopefully for a little bit yet, some cheap enough capital. So, um, you know, that's going to be individual to the farm looking at that situation. I'm sure Mike and John, Mike might have run into those kind of questions too. You know, let me just add a comment. Uh, and now, now this being a Monday morning quarterback, but, you know, you look at your corn silage. You know, do you have an oxygen barrier on top of uh, on top of that uh, a bunker or or that pile? As far as that goes, what kind of plastic covering do you have? Do you have enough packing? You know, uh, there's some tremendous work out of New York State showing that uh, density. In other words, if you get these silage densities up, you know, uh, 18, 20 pounds of dry matter per cubic foot, your your shrink, the amount of feed that uh, is lost due to the fermentation process, goes dramatically down. So certainly, there's a whole element when we look at storing our corn silages in terms of things you can do in August or September or whenever you're filling that. And of course, you guys and gals with silos, that's why you're smiling because you know you've got a tremendous opportunity there, you know, that uh, the compression that you have there to really get this uh, compaction that goes on into the silage as well. And of course, then there's some additives you can put on the top uh, meter or three feet of that bunker that can retard mold formation and, uh, and fermentation losses as well. So the old story is, boy, it, uh, it, you know, I should have packed more last year because my silage, my bunker dropped down a foot from where I stopped. And the answer is, well, I hate to tell you, maybe you should have packed it more, but obviously you, for, you may have lost a lot of dry matter uh, off of that bunker. John, any other comments? No, I, I coming back just to the economic value we have, I mean, so we, we had that in the poll question before, but I, uh, it's my opinion that there are a lot of dairies that don't fully grasp the uh, the economic value of the silage after it's under plastic or in, or in the silo. So uh, we, we need to talk about what what things like like uh, Dr. Hutchins alluded to uh, and, and mentioned, maybe review those from last year, think it out toward this year. 
what can we do to optimize that economic investment? $250,000 is a lot, a lot of dollars at play. Yeah, and John, just think about a one or 2% shrink difference. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're talking real, real dollars. We're talking real dollars now, as uh, one of our congressmen would say. <laughs> you know, you know I, I know one uh, dairy farm that uh, when, it, when there comes to their custom operators and packing those bunker silos, he actually pays incentives based on weight of the packing tractors because he places so much value in getting that proper density. And uh, I, that's served him well over the years. And, and the other thing here, you know, a little bit more of a general observation, but uh, certainly relates to uh, if you're looking at facilities and that uh, one uh, excavator and another construction company that's solely focus, focuses on agricultural building and excavation and digesters came up and asked, hey, where can I advertise to get my name out? What, what that really tells me, and as I extended that conversation, there's a lot of farmers out there keeping their powder dry right now. Just as we going through the second year of this pandemic, you just don't know what the markets are going to do. You don't know. You brought up that fertilizer question earlier and these input costs for the coming year. There's just a lot of uncertainty out there. So um, the other indication, though, that shares tells me is if you're an audience member and you're thinking about doing a project, there might be some actual bandwidth available in some of these uh, contractors when it comes to building and uh, other projects, which may be counter to what you're hearing in uh, many of the news reports. Another question here, alfalfa prices have been climbing and alfalfa is a great pairing with corn silage. They're, they're very good complements. But as, it, as the alfalfa market continues to be strong here, how does that influence uh, corn silage and the amount of corn silage going in the rations here? What are you guys seeing in the field there, Mike and John? Well, I'll jump in first. Uh, Mike Rankin, uh, at some of you may want to see more results from this year's there, the, the November Hordes webinar uh, Mike Rankin had in, in the premium alfalfa two, nationally, $244 a ton for that hay. And, and, and that's saying fats fancy hay and all alfalfa, I think it was like 196 or close to $200. So obviously that really makes a difference. And we do our budgets. And I use two thirds corn silage and one third alfalfa, haylage, hay, silage, whatever you want to call it, pasture. You know, if I made that 100% alfalfa, that would raise my cost $1 per cow per day if I went to 100% alfalfa. So basically, uh, um, uh, the sesame tells me that that corn silage is worth $95, $96 a ton right now. And if you use the old thumb rule, uh, uh, 10, to one, uh, 10 to 1, so 10 times the price of corn, it means corn silage is $50 a ton. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and it's probably cheaper if you look at input costs, but uh, you know it, it becomes a really, really good buy. By the way, Sesame also said alfalfa was still a good buy, but by about 4 or $5 a ton. So it says uh, you're not you're not stealing that at uh, two hundred forty four dollars. I guess when they ran their sesame, they ran it at two twenty a ton. And uh, I'm not sesame sure. Sesame is in the gene, but most people in the audience may know what you're talking about. But sesame is a computer program, right, Mike? Yeah, it's, it's a program from the Ohio State University, which means you put in all your feed ingredients, and it just tells you what is a good buy. It doesn't consider about forage factors or rate of passage or rumen acidosis or butterfat test. It simply says that is what that feed is worth in terms of energy, protein, fiber, and non-fiber factors. And one of the programs also adds in fat. So you got to be kind of eyes wide open to see which program you have. But the good news is it's free now. It used to be you had to subscribe to it. Now you can get it free of charge. And so it allows you to look at what's really good buys, you know, and of course, uh, distillers grains and corn gluten are a very good buy. That's the only good byproduct feeds, at least the ones that we have in our area right now, as far as byproduct feeds go. And then, of course, uh, the uh, because canola is so uh, way down because of the drought, uh, they're not I I exporting as much canola. That that's not as good a buy as it has in some other years as well. But that's what sesame does. It allows you to look at just the value of the nutrients, and uh, you nutritionists then have to work around that. But it, it was basically would tell you and I 100% corn silage. I as we would say, I wish you well with 100% corn silage, John. I'll let you pay, I'll let you balance all those rations at 100% corn silage. Yeah, we, we, we can do it, but uh, we, we have to pay attention to that, that rumen health, that rumen function, in addition to the, the nutrient demands of, of today's dairy cattle to support the kind of uh, component levels that we've been talking about here in the session today. Uh, one thing I'll add to the discussion of just where, where and how does alfalfa fit in, there, there are 
I, I've been a maybe a little bit bearish on, on alfalfa over the last few years, following uh, some stronger winter kill through a lot of regions. However, with today's protein prices, uh, more expensive beans and, and protein complex, and then also uh, inventory. I mean, what inventory do we have available on farm? If we've got stuffed bunkers of alfalfa, maybe we lean a little bit harder into that and stretch out that corn silage inventory just a touch, perhaps let our new crop ferment just a little bit longer, recognizing it's a little bit less digestible starch. Uh, so I, it'll be interesting. We'll, we're going to be looking a little bit harder at alfalfa, I, I, again, I think, as we head into to spring planting. But Mike, you covered it quite well. Yeah, John, I'll just add a, a comment, and that is uh, one of the tough questions is when a farmer calls and says, I'm going to run out of corn slides in May, what should I do? And uh, that, I, I wish you well. Had we known that now in December, John, I think you and I can and 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 and, uh, and uh, Chris can come up with ideas uh, now. But once you run out in May and June, boy, good luck. That's a tough spot. Well, our next dairy live stream will focus on dairy product exports, firsthand accounts from farmers, and that'll be re regarding a trade mission recently to the. Middle East and North Africa, which people call the MENA countries. And that episode will air January 19th, 2022 at 11 a.m. Central Time and will be archived on the Hordes Dairyman YouTube and podcast channels the very next day, just like this episode will be uh, archived tomorrow. In the new year, we will be transitioning dairy live stream to a new system and we'll need you to re-register to continue receiving updates and links to the broadcasts. You only have to sign up once for future episodes. To register, go to www.hordes.com. That's the Hordes Dairyman website, www.hordes.com. And click on Dairy Livestream Registration under the webcast drop-down menu. Uh, Hordes Dairyman is uh, University of Illinois in particular. Jim Baltz and Mike Hutchins have partnered with us, Hordes Dairyman, since January of 2011, when we launched the uh, award-winning Hordes Dairyman webinar series, and uh, and then more recently during the start of the pandemic in April of 2020, Hordes Dairyman Dairy Livestream. Uh, we really appreciate working with Jim Baltz. You don't get to see his bright, smiley face. Uh, Jim started his uh, professional career as a dairy farmer and now transitioned to be an IT specialist and master of a lot of electronic equipment been a wonderful partner. Uh, this will be the last dairy live stream that we work on and next week the Hordes Dairyman webinar will be the final one. Uh, Jim's going to be spending more time on University of Illinois projects that's up off and running here. So, But we want to th really thank Jim for that and that's the reason we're transitioning here to a new platform. It's going to look the same. Uh, my teammates Caitlin and Michaela and Patty are going to be producing that. You'll see the same smiling faces and Corey and Abby. But uh, we look forward to seeing you on January uh, 19th here. And I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And on behalf of John Gazer, Mike Hutchins, and Chris Wolf, I'm Corey Geiger, your host. Thank you for joining us today, and have a great day. Goodbye, everyone.